This is Defenders TV Podcast Episode 65, looking at Daredevil Season 2, Episode 9, Seven Minutes in Heaven. Welcome back, Defenders, to this episode of Defenders TV Podcast, where we are looking at episode 9 of Daredevil, Seven Minutes in Heaven. And uh, I am one of your hosts, John. I'm one of your other hosts, Derek. Lots of numbers in this episode. A lot of numbers. Season 2, episode 9, Seven Minutes in Heaven. Yes. Uh, exactly. Yes. And I think the Punisher was truly in heaven. Yeah, I think most of the other inmates were in hell, though. <laughs> I think so. Maybe, was it... Maybe orgasmic? Yeah, maybe it was. Maybe it was. Uh, yeah, Seven Minutes in Heaven comes from an old game, doesn't it? From uh, from schoolyard game or a school party game where you get seven minutes to kiss a girl in a closet. Um, nothing unusual about that at all. No, but here we have um, the Punisher's equivalent of that where, yeah, he puts uh, a lot of people in hell quite literally absolutely absolutely. awesome and of course yes we will get to that in our podcast and if you are joining us for the first time uh it's just to say that we cover uh, each episode of daredevil and all the other marvel shows and films that we follow by looking at our five main points they can be good indifferent or bad on the episode the film and so we will run through our five discussion points for this episode of daredevil absolutely you may have also noticed that chris unfortunately is not with us for this episode he will be back with us very soon but unfortunately has been taken a little ill this week so get better soon chris uh we, you will be joining us soon i'm sure for our next episode Absolutely. We're kind of flip-flopping here uh, on the podcast. I was away last week and Chris stood in for me. Uh, and this week, Chris unfortunately can't be with us, but uh, I'm back in the chair, mm -hmm. ready for action. And of course, um, you can always find us and subscribe to us on DefendersTVPodcast.com forward slash iTunes. Uh, please subscribe there, leave a review, and um, all uh, reviews are welcome. It helps other people find the podcast and, of course, gives us really good feedback as to how we're doing. And, of course, remember, if you're not an iTunes kind of person, well, then you can go to any other good podcast catcher and search Defenders TV podcast. And of course, again, subscribe, leave a review if you can. That will be most appreciated. Absolutely. And we're also putting our episodes up on YouTube at the moment, just in case that's an easier way for you to access the episodes. Just go and find us on YouTube. Just again, search Defenders TV podcast. And we have gotten some reviews in from iTunes. Uh, one by Tempo JT from Australia uh, in April, uh, titled Fantastic Listening, exclamation mark. They say, thanks, guys. You're doing an awesome job. Love the enthusiasm and passion, along with the informative, critical analysis. I find the comparisons to the comics really interesting, as I have not read them. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Tempo JT, for, for the feedback. And uh, it's really good to, to get that feedback. Um, and we hope uh, we, we keep it up as well. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Yeah, great great to hear from you. Another, another Australian listener. Always good to get them. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Uh, we also got another review in from It Could Be Bunnies from USA, another great uh, handle over on iTunes. <laughs> yeah. uh, this, uh, this one was titled Great Podcast for Fans of Jessica Jones and Daredevil. Um, they say, I found this podcast recently after the release of the second season of Daredevil. The podcast is well done with good sound and editing. I enjoy listening to the hosts discuss the characters and the overall look and feel of the shows. I listen while I clean the house and it makes the time fly by. I plan to join the Facebook group. Thanks very much, Jacoby Bunnies. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much again for the, the feedback. It's just really nice. I uh, really appreciate um, you taking the time out to uh, to, to write a, a review and, and send in, in that feedback. Uh, and obviously subscribing to iTunes as well yeah. in, into the mix. And again, thank you as well to Tempo JT. Again, really appreciated the time taken out. Yeah, definitely. And thanks so much for listening. It's really good to hear from uh, from listeners around the world who are listening to our dulcet tones. And thanks for complimenting me on the editing. I do try. <laughs> absolutely. I think that's all out of the way, John. Yeah, absolutely. I think let's delve into this wonderful episode. Yeah, this bloody violent episode. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it was, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, this episode was directed by 
Stephen Sergic, uh, who's done tons of work in the Marvel Netflix universe. Uh, obviously, he directed Shadows in the Glass and Guilty as Sin this season, which was the last episode. Uh, he also directed two episodes of Jessica Jones, um, Sandwich Saved Me and You're a Winner, which I think I mentioned last time. Uh, but sure, I'll mention them again. Uh, definitely good to remind everybody that we've got a connected universe, at least on the director's side of the, of the table for, for Netflix. Uh, the episode was written by Daredevil showrunner Marco Ramirez, and by Lauren Smith Hisrich, who has written uh, Kinbaku, one of your favorite episodes of the season so far, John. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this, I can honestly say, is another one of my favorite episodes. Excellent. Well, do you want to tell us what they gave us with this episode, John? Sure. As Wilson Fisk introduces himself to Frank Castle, he makes an offer that proves too tempting for the Punisher. Fisk gives him seven glorious minutes with Mr. Dutton, the man who brokered the deal between the Irish, the cartel, and the Dogs of Hell on the day of the massacre of Castle's family. In return, Fisk asks for the elimination of Dutton as his main rival in prison. As chaos breaks out in the prison, Fisk attempts to betray Castle, but his plan fails, forcing him to negotiate. Fisk seeks an opportunity and smuggles the Punisher from jail, so he can pursue his new lead. The blacksmith. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, Foggy and Murdoch question the future of their firm following their disastrous defense of Frank Castle and reluctantly agree to part ways. But Karen won't give up so easily. As she persists with investigating the truth about the carousel massacre, she finds a shocking new piece of evidence that she uses to entice the New York Bulletin to assist in her research. Back at Matt's apartment, Matt also parts ways with Electra Nachos over her indifference to killing. Just as a resurrected Yakuza leader from Daredevil's past lends credence to Stick's claim of immortality. Two episodes, two huge reveals at the end of the episode. And before that, it was just a gigantic hole. We thought that was going to be a huge reveal. Last week, we had Wilson Fisk. And this week, we have... Can we say it now? I think we can. It mm. is spoilery and spoiler-filled, of course. We uh-huh. have Nobu We have back. Nobu back. Yeah. Yes. So cool. Peter I love, yeah. Yeah, love the, the scarring on his face. That was pretty, pretty awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, really, really good. So who wants to kick off the first point? Do you want to go first, John? Yeah, no. My first point, um, and I'm just going to say it out loud, is the kingpin of prison. Oh, we yes. have Wilson Fisk returning in all his uh, Machiavellian and conniving best. Um, For me, this was just like a warm, comforting duvet to put around me. I absolutely loved the reveal in the last episode of um, Wilson Fisk. And here again, Vincent D'Onofrio is just, for me, absolutely great. He shows... um, that kind of frightened child with his rage, with, as I say, his manipulation of all things around him. And I love um, that he is making his way up in the world once again, but this time uh, in the underworld of prison politics and business and leadership. And I just, for me, it was awesome. Absolutely. Did you see how much he was bench pressing at the beginning of this episode? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, I know we, we knew he was powerful in last season. We knew he was strong, but that's like three people that he's lifting up. Yeah. Um, and I loved how his negotiation, as I said in the synopsis, um, was really kicking of the Punisher. I mean, you know, he picked him up and flung him down. He punched, he punched. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Punisher was expecting that he was essentially going to come up against this brick wall. Whatever about size, he's also pretty brutal and uncompromising is Fisk, as well as the Punisher. Certainly. I wondered whether there was a bit of, you know, kindred spirit being recognized there by the Punisher as well, because, uh, okay, you said, well, if I see you again, um, only one of us is going to walk away. Mm-hmm. And Fist returns the compliment with, yes, I look forward to it. Like, I, I'm i not afraid. And I think that is something that the Punisher, quite frankly, respects. Certainly. Certainly, uh, yeah. You yeah. know? But I loved Wilson Fisk here. I loved his uh, machinations uh, with his lawyer. Um, I loved the fact that he starts building a crew in prison. You know, he's got the the two um, Latino guys who are his muscle. But then, and this is one of the other things from this, is Stooge Finnery. I think he was the mortgage and financial broker. 
But is he the new Wesley? Yeah. Uh, because this seems to me to be sort of him establishing a new loyal second in command this time in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really liked that. Um, and I loved how, you know, he's using a res his resources on the outside to get what he wants on the inside and um, to remove Dutton to become the head of the uh, prison trade and, and uh, contraband. Really cool. Yeah, you've got to wonder if Dutton hadn't come to Fisk's cell and said to him, there's only one kingpin in here and that's me. You won't even get a look in. I wonder would Wilson have actually uh, run with his plan this quickly after getting into prison? He says specifically that he wants to keep his head down and just do his time. Um but I, I think just the challenge there that uh, that he wouldn't get a look in and wouldn't be the kingpin of prison just pushed the plan a lot quicker. You see him saying that he might dip into the fund potentially that Vanessa needs to survive um, to in, in order to enable him to become the kingpin of the prison. But it looks like he pr may not need to now. Uh, no need for that when uh, when Dutton has been stabbed and pretty badly damaged by uh, by the attack by the Punisher. Uh, but yeah, love the plan from from kingpin. Didn't expect to see um, Frank holed up inside a room with a ton of other prisoners um, after doing exactly what the kingpin wanted, uh -huh. you know? No, absolutely. I mean, I love the seething, the internal seething. You could just feel it from uh, Wilson Fisk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, portrayed so well by Vincent D'Onofrio. Um, I love the seething that comes from him as... Dutton, Mr. Dutton says, you know, there's only one kingpin around here. Yeah. Like you can just sense it from the performance. It was really, really good. And I, I like, I do have to say as well, uh, one of our listeners uh, and one of our members of our Facebook group, uh, David Wang, he did say, how are you able to leave it for a week once you see the reveal of Wilson Fisk? Um, I think he says you're going to really enjoy this next episode. And mm -hmm. I was kind of chomping at the bit because obviously uh, Derek won't allow us to watch the, the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it would ruin our podcast. Um, if did. <laughs> but like it was worth the wait. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and of course, like it all... Um, just is so reminiscent of Ed Brubacker's run on Daredevil, mm. where Wilson Fisk is operating behind um, prison. I think it's at Rikers Island, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's really just dictating uh, the city of New York from behind prison. And in fact, ultimately, Matt Murdock ends up there with him. So I wonder if that might have um, some connection here to maybe how this season's going to end. And the reason I say that is because it does link in and ties in with Iron Fist. So um, who kind of takes up the mantle of Daredevil um, just briefly to try and exonerate uh, Matt Murdock to show that he wasn't the Daredevil um, by being present in New York fighting right. crime. So it could be a nice little tie in between these four different, um, series that are on, uh, Netflix, uh, leading to the defenders. So it'd be really good, yeah. I think, if, if that's the case. But I love that run from Ed Brubacker. So, I mean, yeah, definitely, um, catch it if you can, um, at your local comic book store. I think it's in collected omnibus edition Certainly now. Is, yeah. um, or uh, you can just search Comixology or, or one of those uh, digital readers yeah, I think as it's well. Probably on Marvel Unlimited as well. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, great run. Really, really enjoyed that run of the comic books as well. Um, but yes, yeah, staying on that side of the house, that was one of my first points was obviously uh, our reintroduction to the Kingpin. I like that it really did take up immediately after the end of season one, even though it's taken nine episodes to get to uh, Vincent D'Onofrio coming back. Uh, I love the fact that it took up directly directly afterwards you have that wonderful moment where he's being told to take off everything that but that belongs to him to take off his suit and you see those uh hugely um important cufflinks being taken off and put into the box on their own uh the cufflinks that is that he took from his father and um, thought that was quite interesting just making sure that we are reminded of how important this is to wilson that he's being stripped down to nothing uh before going into this prison uh, that he's getting all those things taken away from him that he got when he became the kingpin of crime those good suits that he got from vanessa the cufflinks that he got from his father and from vanessa's guidance and um, thought that was quite interesting to do it that way 
Yeah, I absolutely love the little hint back to the cufflinks as he takes them mm. off and, and puts them in the tray. That was really nice. Yeah. I love the rabbit in the snowstorm mm -hmm. reference from season one, where essentially he's looking at the white walls of the cell. That's right. Um, That's where we left him last season, wasn't it? Yeah, really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I love then... Uh, just that, you know, newbies were white here and he, he's there in white. By the end, he's in orange. Mm -hmm. He has assumed the mantle of uh, Kingpin in the prison. So it's just really good. I also, I think one of the officers just smacks his baton across the back of his head. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether he's really survived um, beyond uh, this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought, we're going to see him sort of get his comeuppance. Yeah, yeah. I, know I really mean. liked as well just the fact that it was played with, I'm going to, you know, as you say, stay in here, do my time. And ultimately, he gets all these other people to do his work for him. Absolutely. And he's obviously buying off people in prison, not just fellow prisoners, but it would seem the, the prison guards as well. And um, so in order to buy the Punisher, that seven minutes are in heaven. So mm -hmm. really, really cool, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love his first dealings with Frank, where Frank again uses his, his cat's phrase now. Um, says, I don't help. Shitbag has been mob bosses. Uh, really good. And, and Wilson just kind of ears perk up with the, what do you mean has been? Um, really cool kind of dealing with these two. You know, John Bernthal, we've said it before. He is great in this part, but seeing him stand toe to toe or a little bit shorter, but uh, almost toe-to-toe -to -toe with Vincent D'Onofrio in this scene is something that I just wasn't expecting from the season, uh, and it delivered in spades. Absolutely brilliant. But can we go on to my next point? Yeah, definitely. Because we've mentioned it a few times. It has to be the seven minutes in heaven itself, right? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> it was so good. Yeah, I think we've mentioned a few times, I think Chris particularly has mentioned a few times, what is this season's hallway scene? What's the, what's the moment this season that's reminiscent of the big hallway scene in season two, in episode two of season one? Um, this is the scene that is the hallway scene, right? This is the Punisher's version of the hallway scene yeah. where he just batters everything around him in a pretty one take shot. Absolutely. This is the Punisher's corridor fight uh, yeah. in prison. Um, and it is death that prevails. Uh, death, blood and murder Absolutely. and not knockdowns. Absolutely, yeah. Like I it, love it. The contrast, the reflection on how Daredevil operates as to how the Punisher operates, really, really cool. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just fa fascinating to see the difference between the two. Again, you see the Punisher left alone in the in the hallway with these uh, with these other villains, obviously men under the control of Dutton, uh, who didn't realize Dutton had just been killed because Frank did his work quite stealthily uh, as he slaughtered two people in their uh, in their yeah. cell. Um, but another they... throat slit as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is becoming a bit of a trademark now of this series, and like it's so brutal. I mean, we had Electra do it. Mm -hmm. Now we've got the Punisher do it. Um, yeah. That's pretty, pretty brutal. Yeah, but you see him turn on his heels when he realizes the situation he's in and stare down this room full of pretty bad criminals, I presume. Uh, and he just seems to have that moment of kind of glee on his face, knowing that he's going to be able to take all these guys out. Um, it seems to be, a, it seems to be a, pro a proper determination in him. He's, he knew he was going to make it out of that cell and he's going to take every single person with him uh, before he went. When you say moments of glee, you didn't mean that he burst into song. No, no, no not that kind of glee. <laughs> Locally. Uh, I don't know whether Johnny Bernthal's uh, voice would be good enough for that. I don't know. He could do a raspy blues number, I reckon. Yeah, he's got a proper baritone, I yeah, would say. Definitely. <laughs> um, the Punisher the Musical coming soon, <laughs> which is one thing we haven't mentioned. Yes, that yes. is true. Netflix have commissioned a standalone Punisher series on netflix yes i can see why i can see why with the um just as we're talking about it as we're we'll pop it in here um but i can see why they'd be able to with the charisma of john bernthal i think he is pulling off this character really well and one of the big concerns i would have uh ha where would have had before this show was whether you could actually center a show around someone like frank castle um, and i think they're setting up the kind of uh, the empathy that you need to have with Castle. They're doing quite well through Karen's storyline with them and through Foggy's storyline with them. You're kind of learning a bit about them where you're able to kind of accept when he goes into a room full of uh, villains that he kills them. Um, 
and you're kind of able to accept it because he doesn't kill people that are, that don't warrant it. Uh, this particular scene, okay, maybe not the best example of that because he doesn't know anything about the people that are in the room with him. What he does know is it's either him or uh, them or him, uh, and takes them all out. But I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with a with a Punisher season. Uh, I presume it's not going to affect Defenders. Um, I presume it's going to happen as another show that's happening on Netflix. But really interested to see. Yeah, it. definitely, and one that we will obviously be covering. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely. And I think, um, with, with the Punisher's fight, like, you do have, um, as well, maybe actually the Punisher's fight in the Punisher's own, uh, series will replicate Daredevil's staircase fight, which was another great fight <laughs> maybe, scene, yeah. uh, in, in this season. And uh-huh. um, maybe it'll replicate that so that he'll do a massive, Kill fest on a stir hall or mm-hmm. something like that. It just could you know? be the raid and not in 13 episodes of, of Punisher trying to get out of a building, you know, or in fact, the Judge Dredd movie, which was very similar to that as well. Yeah. yeah. And one of the really good things as well was that after he's finished slaughtering them all, um, there is or what appears to be just this blood soaked skull formation on his chest, which I would th- thought was really cool. I love the fact that the police riot squad or the prison warden riot squad comes in mm-hmm. to, to take him down. But you have Fisk there kind of realizing, um, oh, right, my betrayal hasn't worked here. Yeah. But that he sees immediately uh, another opportunity just to, you know, get him on the streets, getting rid of his rivals and um, by the time he gets out of prison. So yeah, yeah. really, really interesting, I thought that. Yeah, the bloody the bloody skull was really interesting. Yeah, it's kind of something that you'd, you'd only notice for a split second. I'm not sure if it was intended, but it has to be intended if it's the Punisher, right? I thought so. I, I That's how I saw it on, on his chest. Um, I thought it was really cool. Mm-hmm. I love the fact, anyway, that he was soaked in blood Absolutely. after this bloodbath. Um, I think, did he get a... Um, like something through his arm as yep. well. Like there was some really proper, brutal things: neck snapping, stabbing, slicing, like Dicing. axes, like yeah. some kind of axe weapon. So I mean, like Dutton really did have this prison totally under his control. I mean, I wouldn't want to be a prison guard in the slightest no if that's what they kept under their pillows at night. Yeah. yeah, no way, no way, not certainly not in the prison. Um, but yeah, wonderful, wonderful scene. Really enjoyed it, and it was seven minutes of heaven in uh, in this series for me, definitely. Uh, John, do you want to take us on to your next point? Yeah, my next point is just taking up um, uh, what you said about Karen, and but sort of just expanding that out. It's more that the the three amigos become three single amigos now Mm -hmm. and it's three become one and they go off in their uh, separate directions as as individuals now i thought this was really interesting um because uh, as you probably aware, like i do like consequences to kind of persist a bit I, i think it makes um sense it feels real then and this to me is in is the reality of what Matt has done and how he's impacted on Foggy and Karen in spades. And I really like the fact that it's just been continued here. Um, but I, I love um, their different reactions as well. I mean, Foggy kind of almost resigns himself. He comes and says, you know, they need to reconsider. Yeah. And, and Matt almost takes it away from him and says, yeah, no, we're done. You know, we should close up. Um, I have to accept who I am and you need to accept me and you obviously don't. Yeah. And um, I loved how that, you know, when Foggy comes to his door though, that initial split second on it, on his face, he is concerned about the wounds and asks, are you hurt? And, um, and then gradually it just becomes more icy. You know, the bridges have truly been burnt over the Frank Castle defense case. Mm-hmm. Like it, unfortunately, um, and it'll be really interesting just to see how this evolves now. Does, you know, Foggy go off on his own? And, um, you know, does he run for DA if uh, Reyes really gets in, uh, trouble over the revelations that we hear from Dutton after that seven minutes in heaven. Yeah. And I, I really like that. You know, Foggy kind of ultimately resolves himself um to to kind of closing down the law firm. Yeah. Um, and and seeing sort of 
where is this going to like go? You know, there is no more Nelson and Murdoch, he says to Karen. Um, and we need to start thinking about life outside of this office. Will he become a butcher? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah. And, um, but on the other side of it, I absolutely loved how Karen responded to it. In true determination um, and obsessiveness, she is driven once again. She still just can't let it go. It mm-hmm. is the pro- the proverbial phrase, a dog with a bone. Like, it's just she cannot let go. Absolutely. Um, and I love how this moves through this episode. Um, I really liked her determination here um, and, you know, that how she's manages to to come back to um the the New York Bulletin as well to the editor that's she's she's been in contact before and to be honest just then that nod back to um Ben Ulrich's office and, and the file on on his desk mm-hmm. with Karen Page and um, like to begin with I thought that was stuff that was meant for her on Wilson Fisk but I think you said that um it actually showed. Uh, some newspaper cutting. Yes. Yeah, I was going to bring it in my notes, but I might as well bring it in here. Um, yeah, you can clearly see that it's a news story about an unexplained accident that killed a teenage boy. When you read the actual notes themselves, the teenage boy is Kevin Paston Page, uh, a 16-year-old. So you'd presume this is Karen's younger brother, potentially, maybe a cousin, but most likely a brother um, in her hometown who's died in an accident where he went off the road and went through some a chain link fence and you can see from the photographs, smacked into a wall and unfortunately seems to have been killed. Um, Karen, clearly her, by her response, takes resp- responsibility for this, um, but has gotten away with it. There's tons more in that file. That file is very, very packed full of things that have happened. So uh, very interesting to find out. And this is our first real inclination. I know we've been suggesting that storylines from the comic books will come back uh, as to what happens to Karen uh, in the future. But we haven't really talked about what happened in her past. Um, They keep talking about a dark past over and over again. Uh, But here what we find out is that Ben knew exactly what was in her past and that the editor of the New York Bulletin also knows completely what happened in her past. And there's a full file explaining it on the table. So hopefully we get further look into that in future and see what it is that drove Karen to leave her hometown and come to New York and see what it is that drives her all the time to look out for the the little guy more so than um, than her I suppose her position within the law firm would normally allow her to do as a receptionist, you know. Um, she seems to be moving much more towards a legal secretary and now towards a reporter. So. Yeah, and it, it really is a nice development for, for Karen Page, I think, this move into the bulletin. And I think, you know, it's certainly a thread that's occurred in the comics as well, where she is a reporter for, for a newspaper. Right. So um, this, to me, is like a really nice development. And as I say, I, I love that kind of referencing back to Ben Urich. Um, I really yeah. um, just like the fact that, you know, she is dogmatic. She has something in her mind, but she is always looking for the truth. Um, and they can't handle the truth, <laughs> quote Jack Nicholson. <laughs> um, like, it's just really, really good. I love how she kind of persuades the... The, the editor, um, to, to sort of come on board with this. And I like the little interplay that they had where there were, he goes, like, I don't know where you're getting your leads from. Like, I've had 10 or so calls on where am I getting this information from? Mm-hmm. Um, and she goes, what did you say to him? And he goes, I said it was me. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, I took, took the, the credit. credit. Myself, like, yeah. I loved it. I just thought, Absolutely. yeah. Probably typical editor. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That might be harsh against editors, but look, <laughs> um, I just thought that was a really nice little, uh, sort of, bit of banter between the two of them. I thought that was really good. Yeah, which kind of leads me on to my other point as well about the, about how Karen joins New York Bulletin. I really like this idea that she's found something in all the photographs that she's been investigating. Uh, she's found this extra body. Uh, we talked about it on our episode about the, the actual criminal trial of Frank Castle when the uh, medical examiner was in, uh, was up on the stand and said uh, there was another uh, another record that he falsified along with Frank's family. And we were wondering whether it was Frank because he doesn't explicitly say that it was Frank about the bullet wound in his head. It turns out it wasn't Frank. It turns out it was a John Doe, a, a body that was at the scene and then disappeared afterwards. So really excited to see who this was. Um, what we do find out in, uh, in this episode is that the person had tags. This was an undercover cop potentially or an undercover FBI agent. Or potentially an undercover member of the team that has, it's been wearing the black suits all the way throughout the series that we know nothing about yet. Uh, really interested to see what's going to happen. I really like the idea that it's Karen that finds this out by her tenacity. 
Yeah, definitely the men in suits have got to be FBI or some kind of special covert agency of, of the government. Mm -hmm. Hammer, Shield. Shields, Hydra, uh, some organization yeah, that wears suits. But, yeah, but FBI, like he does call it out as an FBI stink, or mm. so he thinks, I think Dutton says to the Punisher, because let's not forget that the Punisher also knows this information as well. Like, and the whole Fisk releasing this, like, pent up caged animal now back into New York mm -hmm. to really extract more information, more terrible vengeance and fury upon um his family's murderers is like really interesting. I mean I do like how Fisk sort of offers that deal to to Frank and he's initially kind of reluctant to take it on board because he thinks he's dealing with the same scum yeah. but ultimately the temptation that you can find out more about who did it and um, you know it's not just um it's not just the Irish and the dogs of hell that are um, involved here. And, and so Dutton actually gives him that information before yeah. his death as well, that it was an FBI sting, um, or so he thinks. But then the medical examiner says there were tags um, on his body, yeah. that he was an undercover cop or something. So it could be cops. Mm-hmm. Because that kind of speculates then that Reyes and the mayor are really uh, much deeper in, in this massacre. Yeah. Um, so I think there's more to it. I really do. I think it's more to it Roxon, than just cops. maybe. It's always rocks on. It's always rocks on. They're always involved. <laughs> Hopefully, it's aim. Actually, <laughs> maybe, maybe I would say it's likely to be rocks on with I their think connection they need, to the hands. And yeah. yeah, I think they need a dose of yellow suits running around. New York. <laughs> the yellow hazmat suits are, be, are coming That'd soon. Be brilliant. Be great. I love little aim characters from. Um, Marvel Lego. Uh, yeah, definitely. Cool. Squeak, 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 squeak. <laughs> and on that, John, do you want to take us on to your next point? Yeah, which is the blacksmith. Mm. Who is the blacksmith? Um, I couldn't actually find anything um, on a Marvel character known as the blacksmith. I might Certainly be nothing significant. Completely definitely. wrong here. But I mean, look, if anyone knows um, about the blacksmith, uh, so to speak, uh, that there's any references from any previous Marvel comics um, and, and graphic novels, then give us a shout at feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. I would love to hear about it. But I didn't see anything at all. So yeah, as you say, you know, is the blacksmith a figure of authority within like i mean respectable authority like mm -hmm. police or fbi or something like that or is he another criminal uh mastermind from the underworld yeah, who yeah. is this blacksmith um it's really interesting is he part of the official sting operation um i just think this is really interesting now Absolutely. it's really elaborating on this carousel massacre um and really how, um, like, as, as Dutton kind of explains, you know, that he was just there as a broker. I love that idea that actually, okay, he's still doing something bad, but he, he was, he was the middleman. Yeah. yeah. And Frank gave him absolutely no quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever about going after the Irish, um, the cartels and, and the bikers, uh, and taking them out. They were presumably the ones with all the guns, whereas he was kind of this independent person. Yeah, but I think you like you like to say that in your own story. I like I like how Dutton put it. That's which, true. That's true. I like how Dutton put it, which was there are a hundred guns and every one of them found a purchase. You'll never finish here, Frank. Um, you know, it's kind of the idea that yes, okay, so. There were some members of the cartel and some members of the Dogs of Hell that may have shot your family inadvertently, but every single person who had a gun in that location is responsible for the deaths of every other person that was in there. You've got a long road ahead of you, um, which I really liked. I thought that was a good little caution. Yeah, that's, Frank. yeah it's a nice line, actually. Um, but yeah, the blacksmith, like intrigue. And it's all linked into heroin. And I mean, this is one of the common threads that is certainly in Daredevil. Yeah. It could potentially be a um, motivating factor with Luke Cage, given that, um, you know, his past uh, in the comics, at least, is suggestive of, of being a, you know, a petty dealer or being em embroiled and involved unwittingly in that whole arena. You mm -hmm. have... Then with the heroin and the opium trade, you get the links 
um, to Madame Gao and um, the steel serpent symbol that, that we saw in season one. Yeah. Obviously, um, all that trade with the hand and the Yakuza uh, being involved um, that has the potential to link in also to Iron Fist. So this is one of those common threads that's really coming through um, these series to me, um, along with um, a few other things which, like, the big urn uh, with the symbolic um, scripts um, and, and writings there. Mm -hmm. Like, this is all getting nicely... Uh, uh, mysterious now. It's yeah. really getting intriguing what's in the urn and, and so on. Mm -hmm. But I think first off, who is the blacksmith? You know, a lot of questions coming out in, in this episode. Really cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those, uh, those, Chinese, those Japanese characters that are on the urn actually mean rebirth and resurrection or rebirth and renewal, uh, which I think is quite interesting. That was a nice little touch in the episode. Uh, and the urn itself was creepy as heck. It does lead me on to my, a little, little point that I had, which was just Stan the accountant, um, Matt tracking down stand the accountant it's the it's the old wire adage of uh, follow the money and you'll find your way um so he tracks down stand the accountant whose son has been kidnapped by uh, by the the hand uh, to make him work for them uh, leading us to a great scene where we get again another expansion of the world where we have all of these uh, these kids or all of these uh, these hostages who are being drained of their blood for the gigantic urn, um, which is the secret to immortality, I presume, is uh, is held within that urn. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And there's one little touch that's in there, um, which is Stan's son when he gets taken out. I was convinced this was actually going to be a moment with Danny Rand potentially uh, in there. He looks so like my idea of Iron Fist, mm -hmm. the long blonde hair, thin looking wiry guy. Uh, I thought that was going to be a little... A little uh, Easter egg for us in there, but no, no connection at all, unfortunately. So it's not Stan Rand. Uh, I presume that's not uh, not Danny's father. No, no, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But like the rebirth, um, resurrection on the the side of that urn, mm -hmm. it is really interesting because. The Iron Fist arcs, a lot of them are all to do with rebirth and rejuvenation mm. uh, in terms of the Iron Fist himself, who um, is renewed um, and there are new Iron Fists and people take up the mantle of the Iron Fist um, in the lost city of Kun Lum. Like they have to uh, go and f uh, fight uh, Shu Lao, the Undying, which is the dragon, right, right. Uh, to get the, uh, the Iron Fist power um, and energy for... Um, Essentially, it's superpower. Right. And so one of the things I'm wondering that may be in the urn is, you know, on the one hand, we have seen the steel serpent symbol. And, of course, there's Davos, who could be master of the cranes. There's also the mother of the cranes, who could be uh, Madame Gao. Mm. Um, but one of the other aspects could be the Chi Lin, uh, which uh, goes after to try and kill uh, the Iron Fist every time they have been renewed as well. And I, I think in the the Immortal Iron Fist series, it's all kind of bound together now in three volumes, you really do have um, this kind of amorphous thing that is reborn um, and, and changes shape as well. So right. it, it becomes a really powerful enemy of, of Iron Fist. And of course, his sole aim is to destroy the Iron Fist um, and, and to kill them. So... Um, I'm wondering if, you know, maybe this is one aspect of the hand that they're trying to destroy that power, which could all ultimately stop them. I don't know. It's a complete and utter over the top theory from my <laughs> point of view, but I just think that would be uh, really, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great if it's setting up some of the stuff that we're going to see in Iron Fist when it comes next year. It definitely feels like this is something that belongs in the Iron Fist universe and it does belong within Daredevil. They are connected as characters as well. And um, the hand being hugely important Daredevil villains, uh, obviously Electra being involved and Stick. And as we said last time, Stone and all, the, all of those characters as well. All connected in this universe and, and really Big interesting time. to see something much more spiritual and much more um, unusual here. The reaction in this scene, I suppose, of Matt to the return of Nobu uh, is huge. You know, the, the reaction of, wow, OK, Stick was correct. This is someone that came back from the dead. Um, it, it's a shocking moment, really, for, for Matt 
a real surprise as a member of the audience, obviously watching it as well. I'm sure everybody was surprised when they when they watched this episode to see Nobu back. Uh, but delighted, delighted to see him back. Oh, absolutely. So cool to have him back. I love the fact that he's got his knives on the end of the chain mm-hmm. as well, his signature weapon that obviously caused Daredevil so much, so much pain. Uh, pain and yeah. agony. And the fact that he calls it out too, you have some scars to remember me by, um, the way it should be. We have unfinished business, you know, and then as he leaves, you know, he says, the rising is coming. Um, you are not the only devil in this city. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, really, um, foreboding, really. Um, and absolutely loved it. Really gives just a whole extra dimension to this. And I, I actually do really like the fact that it's, it's grounded this, this kind of um, uh, spiritual and maybe mystical element it is grounded um, in sort of the heroin trade, gangland warfare. Heroin brings you back to life? No, but like it, that, that it, it's, it's everyday things that are grounding this in the real world, yeah. even though it is not of this world, that it, it's those, um, those criminal things. And I mean, let's face it, the defenders ultimately as a body, are different from the Avengers. They are um, disparate groups of people, generally individuals, that come to protect Earth from more mystical elements. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- those threats that aren't necessarily um, super villains or, um, I suppose, aliens, ultimately. Yeah. But these deal with more mystical, different realms, dimensions, you name it. Th- those different types of threats facing uh, the, the world. So it really fits into that nicely yeah. um, and does have to build that kind of notion within within the world, just as obviously Doctor Strange um, is doing that within the film world. And I do hope that these two collide in a lovely kaleidoscope of many different colours. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, John, do you have a final point? No, Nobu was one of my, um, you know, other points as well that he lives and I'm, I'm so pleased that he's back really am and um, I, I love the fact that it was probably the worst blood transfusion surface ever uh, in the history of, of medical um sort of blood transfusion I mean this looked like okay they may have just been rescued but I suspect they might die out because of infection Absolutely. like this was pretty pretty brutal mm-hmm. um, and bizarrely I slightly felt sorry for the accountant here um, with the fact that his son uh, was being trussed up I just thought they had him captive like but treating him pretty well not yeah. that he was caged and being sucked dry of his blood exactly it does show the intention of the hand as well they're telling him that you work for us uh, or else or else we'll kill your son and they're do- what they're doing to the to his son is far worse really uh, than killing him it's it's well maybe not far worse he may live um, this this way but uh, it is pretty brutal um yeah no i know exactly what you mean uh, for my final point there is the other breakup in the episode that we didn't really talk about which is the breakup of electra and matt that is true yes um she killed when she was only a wee toddler yeah yeah what a fascinating story what an interesting insight into electra effectively that she is an assassin. This is what she's, that's her subtitle, I suppose, in the comic books. Her name is Electra Nachos. Yeah. Her subtitle is The Assassin. Um, so really interesting to see that she killed for the first time at 12, um, not for any reason, not for defending herself, not for protecting herself or anybody else. It turns out that she enjoyed it and she's lived with that ever since. I uh, love the discussion between the two of them where uh, Matt says to her, we need to get away from each other. We have to stop corrupting each other. Uh, that's what happens. I love you. I know you love me, but we are corrupting each other. Like, really interesting lines. And then he says to her, uh, this is a war that I need to fight alone. I need you out of the way and then I can do my job uh, or else we're going to continue to pull each other down. But uh, yeah, really, really interesting. I am very doubtful that either stick or Electra are staying away for very long, to be honest. I think they're going to come back. This is their war that Matt is kind of infringing upon, uh, but he's sending them away because they've come to his city, as he keeps saying. There's no way they're giving up this war. They are the uh, the protectors. They are the chaste. They are the ones that are supposed to be protecting the world from the hand, so they'll be coming back to uh, to join up with Matt, whether he likes it or not. Definitely. I mean, I really sort of enjoyed the fact that, um, you know, when, when she's pressed on 
this whole killing. Matt Murdock goes, you know, did you enjoy it? And she goes, no, I did it so that I knew that I could. Like a really interesting question because there was part of me up until then which thought that she did this out of enjoyment and that's why she became an assassin. Mm. But it is... Uh, it gives a feeling of a destiny or a fate that has been bestowed upon her, yeah. which, you know, she had to make sure that she could do. And I, I think that um fits in with some law around a lecture that, you know, this isn't by accident that she um has become the assassin, that it, there's very much a, um you know, she's identified as being this master assassin. Um and that's what she is trained and becomes. Yeah. I don't know Electra's storyline that well, to be honest, but, you know, it's something that I'm really enjoying seeing. I, I love the, again, the, the hot and cold between Matt and, and Electra. And yeah, no doubt hot will come back, uh, uh, into this relationship. Definitely. At some point, I think it really as well just closes the circle with, with stick and the fact that, that Matt was very dismissive of Stick's claim to this power to to raise the dead of yeah. immortality that the Hand had found uh, back in the day, and I think that this really is um, a nice way of bringing these back together, it, and it almost. You know, it makes sense then with the splitting up of the three because this is taking Matt in a completely different direction. This is not getting the mugger or the diamond uh, thief that we saw at the start of this uh, season. Absolutely. This has suddenly moved his territory into a whole new level. A realm. Um, or new realm. Yeah. yeah. And this really now does take him to a different place to some extent uh, compared to to Foggy and Karen. Certainly. And and it makes sense that their stories would diverge as such then here. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to see how that works uh, as well. So, like, so many threads here that I'm enjoying. It's just crazy. Definitely. And one other thing I really liked about the scenes with uh, Electra and, and um, Matt is that they do have cleaners that come around and take away the bodies and clean up Matt's house and get it back to pristine condition while he's knocked out. I just thought it was really interesting that that's how the episode started. I loved seeing it through Matt's eyes as... He wouldn't, I suppose, uh, that it's all going on around him and he's hearing things. He doesn't know what he's, but what he's hearing, uh, but he can tell that something's going on, uh, around him all the way through it. I thought that was really, really good, uh, as a nice start to the episode. So we ended at the start, uh, with our five points, uh, about this episode. Uh, any notes about the episode, John? Yeah, I have, um, just one. I love the fact that, um, Fisk is with Dutton as he slowly um drowns in his own fluids uh, in his lungs. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, I say he's rubbing salt into the wounds, but Fisk is actually putting salt onto his meat and two veg <laughs> uh, as Dutton slowly, um <laughs> not those two meat and two veg I hasten to add, um, but that he um, slowly... <laughs> chucking salt and pepper onto his dinner as he sits next to Dutton saying, what did you say again, ultimately? Mm -hmm. Like, I really, really thought this was um, just a nice kind of Shakespearean type of um, moment within yeah. this episode, you know, really just rubbing his face in, in it, you know? The kind of, don't you worry, I'll be right here while you die. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought it was so good. Totally brutal. So malicious uh, of Wilson Fisk uh, to do that. You know, brilliant. Yeah, totally brutal. One other note for me, which is just about Ben Donovan, the lawyer for Wilson Fisk, the guy who's carrying out all of his orders. Uh, ben Donovan was a character that was created for Luke Cage um, back in the 70s. So it is likely or very possible that we'll see that character back uh, when Luke Cage could be having some trouble with the law in his own series starting uh, later on in the interesting. year. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was quite cool. Quite an interesting one. I like these little side characters. But unfortunately, we did look it up. Uh, there is no Dutton in the comic books. We don't see anything about uh, about the blacksmith in the comic books. Um, not a huge amount of the other characters. There's no Stooge Finney, as far as I could see, uh, that's in the comic books. But please correct us if we're wrong. Please send us an old email then to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com or come and join us over on our Facebook group at... Uh, just go to Facebook.com slash groups slash DefendersTVPodcast. So that only leaves us with one last thing to do on this episode. John, do you defend this episode of Daredevil? Season 2, Episode 9, 7 Minutes in Heaven. 
Yeah, I strongly defend this episode of Daredevil. I am, um, I would give this, uh, 4.5 shivs out of, uh, five as they <laughs> plunge repeatedly into, uh, the stomach of Mr. Dutton. Oof. Um, this Ricky. is absolutely great, bloody, vindictive Daredevil. We have the return of Wilson Fisk, which is just like, oh my goodness, brilliant. Love. Vincent D'Onofrio's betrayal. Mm-hmm. Have we found the new Wesley in Stooge Finnery? I really hope so. Um, you know, he's the intelligence there um, in, in that sense. And what I mean by intelligence, I mean good intelligence, not bad intelligence. <laughs> he is, you know, he's the new Wesley possibly uh, being introduced here, which I really liked. The Wesley behind the bars. Um, you had the the breakup of... of um, Nelson and Murdoch, um, attorneys at law. You have, um, the, the three principal characters, uh, moving and splitting apart, diverging into their own, um, separate, uh, ways. Obviously, Daredevil looking at a completely different challenge now on the scene in Hell's Kitchen mm-hmm. with the return of Nobu again. Absolute favorite of mine. So good to see him there. Loved the scar. Loved his weapons. I uh, love that sort of brief little um, foray into, uh, again, combat between the two of them. Not for very long, but just enough. You know there's going to be something that re- comes back again Certainly. Um, in, in another episode. You have Karen determined as ever to find out the truth. Absolutely loved it. Um, and I thought it was just really poignant moving into Ben Ulrich's office to continue her research under the wing of the New York Bulletin. And then finally, you know, I suppose one of the main questions here is what is in that urn? What is Foggy going to do? Is he still going to be a butcher? Um, or is he going to put his hand to being possibly the, the new DA in town when Reyes um, maybe hits the buffers? in her rise to the top uh, as she gets found out. And we obviously, in connection with that, we find out a bit more about Frank Castle, his motives. That bloody fight, amazing. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely amazing. And we get to hear some more info. FBI Sting, or is it? The Blacksmith, who is he, she, it? Um, Fantastic. Loads of intrigue. Um, just a really, 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 um, good episode. Solid. Well, fantastic episode. Sorry, I'm really underselling it mm-hmm. here. Really, really cool. I think this could be close to a 4.9 for you, John. It probably like, could, but yeah. I, I don't know whether I ever really go that high. Although you did kind of say 4.8 last week for, on my behalf. Yes. But I didn't tell you to say That's that. That's very true. Very so, true. So, but on that basis, I would give it a 4.9 right. then. Right, very good, very good. Derek, do you defend this episode of Daredevil? Totally, absolutely. You've said everything I wanted to say. There's there's so much going on in this episode. I love the breakup of uh, Elektra and Matt as well as the breakup of Matt and the rest of his team around him. He's trying to be the lone wolf. He's trying to do what Stick originally told, told him to do, which is keep away from all of your friends, don't have any attachments. He's trying to break all that up around him. I just don't believe that it's going to happen the way he wants it to. Uh, I believe that Electra's going to come back. Stick's going to come back. Foggy will absolutely come back. This wouldn't be a Matt Murdock, Foggy Nelson story if they didn't break up at some point and get back together at some point. Uh, they will get back together in the future, but maybe it'll be after the big battle. Maybe it'll be at the end of episode 13 that will kind of wrap it up. They'll get back together. Uh, things look very bleak, but I like it. I like it where it is right now. Um, the scenes between Vincent D'Onofrio and John Bernthal in the in the uh, prison itself, I thought were fantastic. Some of the best scenes so far this season. Absolutely. Uh, just seeing them go toe to toe, as I mentioned, just so good. Uh, the idea that Kingpin, within a few days and a bit of a bit of cash, uh, he's got everybody under his under his thumb. Uh, so many of the guards are in there. There was a question that I had when John Bernthal was leaving, or when Frank Castle's leaving the prison. He takes off the riot helmet that is protecting his protecting who he is before he leaves the prison. He takes it off directly outside the front gate. In fact, before he gets to the front gate, does Wilson Fisk have every single person in the prison? Uh, under his, under his, uh, <laughs> probably yeah, under his, in his wallet or in his pocket, I guess you'd say, uh, does he have everybody or was that just a, a slight problem with the episode or 
Does Frank not care? Um, would anybody stop Frank after what he did in, inside the prison? Um, really, really good, though. I loved the episode overall. Uh, totally enjoyable. No, absolutely. This was like 54 minutes in heaven for the audience. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic. And, and again, like moving on to episode 10, and I really can't wait to see what they do. This is like they have not dropped the ball um, at all here for me this season. I have been really, really enjoying it loads. Oh, so yeah. cool. So good. Definitely, definitely really enjoying it. Only four more episodes left to go, unfortunately, know, but uh, but looking forward to every single one of them. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast to make sure you get all the rest of our coverage uh, of Daredevil, of all the other Defender shows, of Marvel, Captain America, Civil War, obviously, which came out this week. You can get that by just going to DefendersTVPodcast.com slash iTunes or going to any Kingpin loving or Punisher loving podcast app uh, of your choice on android <laughs> uh, just search for defenders tv podcast as i mentioned episodes are also going up on youtube find our youtube channel uh, you should get a couple of a uh, couple of images of us up there a couple of videos of us up there um talking <laughs> yeah. about some of the uh, some of the stuff that uh, that we're covering like medusa we'll turn you to stone <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe don't look in the eyes don't look in the eyes but if you want to give us any feedback on how we look whether we need some more makeup <laughs> or, uh, or better lighting you can also email us at feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com. Yeah, maybe we need heavy foundation, but <laughs> if we do, you can also discuss that on our Facebook group. Just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV Podcast. And of course, you can join our Twitter community as well. Just go to um, at Defenders Cast yeah. and join us and tweet at us uh, repeatedly. Absolutely. Um, that would be absolutely brilliant as well. Just remember, Wilson Fisker's back, Nobu lives, and we may have Wesley back in the house. Or a new Wesley, yeah, anyway. New yeah. Wesley, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Thanks for listening. Bye.